Thank you very much. Okay, when you're done, I'll make sure we get you set back up the way you were. Okay, I'm thanks. I'm also going to hook you up to the microphone. Okay. Oh, I know what's up there. Check, 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 check. I'm going to lock this on so that it can't even, it can't even accidentally turn around. Okay. Put, put that wherever that's comfortable for you. All right. And we will um, we'll just turn it on. Yep, yep, you're muted right now, so appreciate it. You'll be muted right up to the point before you start to talk. Okay, do we need to get going? I'll be, I'll be coordinating the Q&A. Yeah, all right, good. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, all right, all right. So we're we gonna get going now. It's, um, or are we gonna wait a little while? Are we gonna go now?
Yeah, he probably needs to stay in there next. He probably needs to play water and come yeah. up here. All right, all right, all right. He's okay. Get deep yeah. All right. Oh, no, you can. Oh, okay. You're waiting for me. All right. All right. As soon as you're done, you All right. All right. Okay. Good. Hi, everyone. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's Friday evening lecture. My name is Nipan Patel. I'm the director of the Marine Biological Laboratory. Thanks to you, thanks to all of you that are joining us in person at the Cornelia Clapp Auditorium, and to those who are joining virtually this evening. Throughout this summer, we are you know, recognizing past members of the MBL community who have made extraordinary contributions to this storied institution. Tonight is my privilege to share with you the highlights of the life and the work of Lillian Von Morgan, a scientist and investigator at the MBL, along with her husband, Thomas Hunt Morgan, an MBL faculty member, investigator, corporate member, and trustee. When Lillian, when Lillian Von Morgan died in 1952, she had 18 scientific publications to her credit, and it made significant contributions to the nascent field of genetics, along with research and development and regeneration. Despite these accomplishments, Lillian never had any professional position as a scientist in, until 1946, when the California Institute of Technology appointed her as a research associate. This overdue recognition came one year after the death of her husband, Thomas Hunt Morgan, a pioneer geneticist and recipient of the 1933 Nobel Prize in Medicine or Physiology. Early in her career, Lillian found a scientific home as an independent investigator at the Marine Biological 
laboratory. And it was here in Woods Hole that Lillian and Thomas furthered their interest in developmental biology and in one another. Lillian first met Thomas at the MBL in the summer of 1891, after she graduated with a degree in biology from Bryn Mawr College. Thomas had recently received his PhD in zoology from John Ho Johns Hopkins University and accepted a faculty position at Bryn Mawr. In the fall, Lillian went to Zurich to study comparative anatomy, where she, when she came back, she began working on a master's degree with Thomas Morgan. At Bryn Mawr, Thomas trained a large group of students, including Lillian, in original research approaches. Their results were published in the Bryn Mawr Collegiate Mo College monographs. After receiving her master's, Lillian returned to the MBL as an independent investigator for many summers throughout the 1890s. She published embryological studies in frogs and mollusks. Thomas was active at the MBL in both research and leadership. And in 1897, he was named an MBL trustee, trustee, a position he held for the rest of his life. In 1904, Thomas and Lillian were married. Their first trial followed in 1906 and three more. Lillian set aside her research for the next 15 years, taking full responsibility for raising their children and running the household. For the next 25 years, the, span, the family spent winters in New York. Thomas was a faculty member at, the, at Columbia University and summers in Woods Hole. They had a large and busy household at 56 Buzzard Bay Avenue. There they enjoyed the company of many scientific colleagues and friends. During this time, Lillian co-founded the Summer School Club in Woods Hole, which evolved into the Children's School of Science, still operating today. Thomas pursued many lines of investigation at the MBL, all related to, the, to his central interest in sex determination, development, and heredity. Around 1908, he began breeding fruit flies, Drosophila, to probe how Darwin's theory of natural selection might work. This research led him to identify the role of chromosomes in heredity, work that brought him a Nobel Prize in 1933. By the 1920s, the Morgan children had grown, and Lillian returned to research. She transitioned into experimental genetics. While she lacked an appointment at Columbia, Thomas gave Lillian space in his work to, independent, to work independently where she made significant contributions on her own. In 1928, the Morgan family moved to California where Thomas became head of the biology division at the California Institute of Technology. There, Lillian was even more productive, publishing nine single author papers on Drosophila. The Morgans continued to spend many summers in Woods Hole, driving across the country to get here. Thomas's genetics work continued, but his interest returned to experimental embryology. While the Morgans' partnership in life was enduring and fruitful, in science they were on unequal ground, owing to the barriers 20th century women faced in gaining professional stature. At the end of Thomas's life, after he and Lillian had separated, had, sorry, had separately published more than 100 papers, they produced their first co-authored study on the maintenance of a Drosophila stock center. So we are pleased to honor the life and contribution of Thomas Hunt Morgan and Lillian von Morgan, both pioneers in their field and the life of the Marine Biological Laboratory. And it's really wonderful that we can acknowledge the, all of these people who've made these important contributions who some of who are very well acknowledged in the MBL community and others who really deserve mention. And so with that, I'd like to go ahead and, and introduce our introducer. So uh, Claire Waterman, NIH Distinguished Investigator and MBL Whitman Center Scientist who will introduce tonight's speaker. Claire. Good evening to you present here and uh, present uh, virtually on the internet. It's a real pleasure to introduce Tim Springer as the Friday evening lecturer in the newly christened CLAP Auditorium, which to you all might seem like something new and different, but to me as a, a alumnus of Mount Holyoke College, uh, I uh, all of my biology lectures at Mount Holyoke, the entire time I was an undergrad were in the CLAP Auditorium, similarly named. Uh, uh, um, so there were jokes about uh, girls who study biology catching the clap. Um, <laughs> and uh, Mount Holyoke being about 175 years ahead of MBL and recognizing the important contributions of women in science, but at least we caught up eventually here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. 
So it is a real pleasure to introduce Tim Springer, who is an award-winning scientist with over 560 publications and 30 patents, uh, eight-time entrepreneur, a philanthropist, a former MBL Whitman investigator, and more recently, a member of the uh, MBL Board of Trustees and a homeowning neighborhood neighbor of ours here in Woods Hole. Um, it's a pleasure to have him as a neighbor and uh, to have him associated with the MBL. Uh, he's the Latham Family Professor of Biological Chemistry and Molecular Pharmacology at, uh, and Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Boston, Boston Children's. He's a member of the National Academy of Science, a uh, winner of the Cancer Research Institute Coley Award, uh, the Crawford Prize, the Gardner, the Gardner Award, uh, and many others. Uh, he earned his PhD uh, in molecular biology and biochemistry at Harvard and did his postdoc in the laboratory of uh, the Nobel laureate Cesar Mil uh, Milstein in Cambridge, England. Uh, there he developed uh, monoclonal antibodies uh, to the surface of leukocytes, looking for the proteins uh, to inhibit the proteins that cause leukocytes to adhere to, to the endothelium and thereby uh, discovered uh, the, the uh, adhesion receptors of the immune system that uh, were sort of uh, um, co-discovered at a similar time by his colleague, uh, um, uh, yeah, <laughs> Eugene Butcher, um, and uh, named by Richard Hines, uh, the integrin family of adhesion receptors. Um, this discovery launched his uh, extensive and award-winning uh, research program characterizing the adhesion proteins of uh, the immune system, and also led to the launching of several successful companies, the first of which utilized those original monoclonal antibodies to launch the company Leukocyte um, in 1993. It was the first of seven successful companies that he founded or invested in, including being a major angel investor for the COVID vaccine creator Moderna, and when they went public, uh, uh, he got to ring the bell on the NASDAQ to open up the trading for that day. Uh, um, and I think he had a great time doing that. It was a great video. <laughs> um, uh, he's been acknowledged by Forbes as sort of a Midas touch uh, in uh, choosing uh, uh, biotechs uh, that are gonna go on to be successful, which is ironic uh, because he named one of the, the domains of the uh, uh, integrant also uh, the Midas, uh, the, the place that uh, um, coordinates the, the metal ion. Um, so he's uh, uh, the Midas touch in integrants and in investing. And he's become a, a major philanthropist. And uh, this led to him to um, launch a protein institute uh, at, at, uh, in Boston that is uh, aimed at uh, generating synthetic antibodies to all cell surface proteins. Uh, these can be serve serve as uh, research reagents and also to uh, uh, eventual therapeutics. He's also endowed many chairs and professorships, uh, several chairs and professorships at, at Harvard, Boston's Children, and University of California. So I got to know Tim because he got interested in my work on actin dynamics and cell migration, where I had been characterizing a phenomenon known as actin retrograde flow that happens at the leading edge of migrating cells. And through the, his studies, he knew that in order for integrins to get activated, to take on a conformation that allowed them to bind uh, uh, their ligands with high affinity, they had to undergo a conformational change that required energy input. But these aren't enzymes that hydrolyze ATP. So the mystery was, where's that energy coming from? And Tim realized that uh, these uh, integrins were getting activated in a close proximity to the actin movement that I had been characterizing. And he thought, well, maybe the integrins can co-opt that actin movement uh, to utilize that energy to, to activate the integrin receptors. He invited me for a, a seminar at Harvard. I, I came, we talked, he uh, I told him about the marine biology lab. He said he was interested in having his trainees learn microscopy. I said, the physiology course is a great place for your trainees to learn microscopy. Uh, that summer, he sent uh, one of his trainees, Pontus, to the MBL when I was uh, the director of the physiology course, and I was doing a, a project with G2 Mayer 
um, uh, trying to test his um, uh, uh, lateral force hypothesis, one of the predictions of that hypothesis was that the integrins should get aligned by the actin flow when the actin tugs on. And so we were, G2 is an expert in fluorescence polarization microscopy, and I wanted to test the hypothesis that the integrins were, were getting oriented by the actin flow. This led to a collaboration between me, Tim, and G2, uh, Whitman investigators for about four or five summers, uh, many meetings in Lilly 103, uh, lab meetings together that were fun, very, very illuminating to have the, him, G2, me in the same room, got contentious at points. Uh, a lot of, it was really spectacular and uh, ended up with a couple of really lovely publications. Um, during that time that I was getting to know him, I sort of ignored all the Tim Springer hype. You know, there's all this Tim Springer hype. And I was just like, I just want to meet this guy on his level and, and, and get to know him as a person. And I really got to know him quite well as a scientist and a friend. I learned that he's a wicked, determined sunfish sailor and now uh, um, paddleboarder. Uh, he's a sensitive poet who writes uh, poems and has them carved on giant river rocks that he has uh, artfully arranged around his garden in, uh, in, in uh, his house at Boston, that he loves the vineyard and the Upper Cape uh, dearly. Uh, he drives a pretty grungy old car as little as possible and rides his bike where as much as he possibly can, um, that he commissions modern dances to act out his molecular uh, uh, mechanisms that he's uh, characterized and discovered, and that he has a great fondness for his daughter's budding uh, artistic abilities and political activism. So it really gives me great pleasure tonight to introduce my colleague and friend, Tim Springer, who will give a talk tonight that strips away the Tim Springer hype and um, shows you just what he loves about science. And the title of the talk is, how I have scientific fun, discoveries, mechanisms, therapeutics, and learning. So give us the unhyped talk, Tim. It's a real pleasure to introduce you. Well, thank you very much, Claire. That was um, a wonderful and typically very energetic and spirited um, <laughs> introduction. Um, and. Um, all the stuff you said in the last half was true um, about um, all of you know my interest in energy and actin polymerization, and um, you know and and all the other things and and you portrayed me is basically I'm I'm a bit of um, um, I like to do fun and crazy things, um, and um, uh, I won't say about the, some of the stuff in the first half got jumbled, but. You know, I mean, the spirit was right. <laughs> so I didn't necessarily do all the things she said. So, uh, but, but anyhow, um, now if I can, um, yeah. So I'm supposed to share a screen here, I believe. Um, desktop two, um, share. And um, I think, yeah, we're all good. All right, thanks. So, it's wonderful to be here for all you people uh, on the web and, and in the audience, there's a lot of uh, very warm friends here. So it, it's wonderful to see you. Um, and um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about myself, if you don't mind, um, uh, to start with. And, and you know, I really wanna talk about um, how I, I've been having scientific fun. And different scientists contribute in different ways. Um, and so we have fun in different ways. Uh, but as you can see, a lot of us are, are pretty wild and crazy about what we do. Um, and um, academics and basic research is hard work. So having fun is important. It's what keeps us going. And maybe even it leads to creativity. Um, so <clears throat> my dad grew up as the 10th child on a farm in Pennsylvania. Um, and uh, he, uh, moved to Sacramento um, and um, with pr three kids already out of medical school. And um, he and my mom, you know, had six children. I was the first. 
Um, and, you know, he was, a, he was a family physician in Sacramento. And you have to be resourceful and hardworking on a farm. And I think I uh, learned some of that from him. Um, at, at Berkeley, um, I, uh, I love studying physics and biochemistry and even neurobiology. And I got my first exposure to immunology. And when I graduated, I decided to do a PhD. I planned to pursue an academic career and figured that I would never earn as much money as my dad, um, but this deficiency would be more than compensated by um, the freedom, travel, and adventure allowed by academics. Um, and of course, I, I really didn't know uh, much at all about what would happen. It was really, really hard to say. So um, I did my PhD with Jack Strominger at Harvard. And uh, in the summer, he would often take me and some other people in the lab um, sailing down here in Woods Hole. And he had taken a physiology course at the MBL. And um, it's partly through him that I developed a very early on in an affinity for the Marine Biological Laboratory. Um, I then um, did a postdoc with Cesar Milstein, who had just invented monoclonal antibodies. I learned how to make them uh, from him personally. And monoclonal antibodies have been incredibly important uh, to me in my career ever since. And when we come to philanthropy, you can see the connection with a new kind of antibodies. So when I began as a faculty member at Harvard Medical School in 1977, um, a, a kind of lymphocyte called a B cell was well understood. Um, they made antibodies, and antibodies are secreted into the bloodstream, um, and uh, they work at a distance. So they're called magic bullets. Um, antibodies are highly specific for foreign antigens. Um, they bind to and neutralize, for example, um, viruses and uh, bacteria uh, that infect us. Um, and they also flag um, antigens on, on foreign pathogens for elimination by the body. And they're just incredibly specific for um, anything um, that um, is foreign to an organism. Um, but um, it, it was a different subset of cells I was interested in, uh, the, the T lymphocyte or the T cell. Um, it was really fascinating. Um, because it, it didn't work at a distance. Um, T cells required uh, direct cell cell contact to recognize their antigen. They form the suction cup like process to recognize an antigen bearing cell. And then um, they delivered signals across this contact. It could be to um, other, other cells of the immune system, or it could be to um, uh, um, a virally infected cell or a tumor cell, which uh, a certain kind of T cell called the killer T cell could kill. Um, and now this was all new. Nobody knew anything about um, the molecules that were in this contact um, and how it worked. So that's why it was such a fascinating new, new system to study. Um, and the immunologists we're highly interested in the antigen receptor, which would be the equivalent of the antibody um, from the B cell. Um, but there was something unusual about this process uh, because this adhesion process required magnesium ions and antibodies did not require magnesium ions. So I thought that there must be other molecules besides um, the antigen receptor that uh, were involved in this process including this magnesium dependent one. And um, I've always been um, a bit of an, an outsider or outlier, you know, so um, I always like taking the, the, the path not taken. Um, and uh, so I decided to work on this system. Um, and the other interesting thing was that there were other cells um, like connected tissue cells that um, bound to components of the extracellular matrix um, and uh, this adhesion also required magnesium. This adhesion also required magnesium. So um, I thought that these magnesium-dependent molecules might be widely important 
and you'll see how that connects with the story when we come to integrants. Um, but how would um, I identify uh, these novel molecules that were present in this contact zone between the killer T cell and the interacting cell? Um, well, with monoclonal antibodies, because um, you could immunize um, uh, an animal uh, with um, a whole cell uh, from a different animal. And um, for example, um, you know, rec commonly today we would uh, immunize a, um, a, um, a mouse with, um, a, um, with a human cell, although I was immunizing rats with mouse cells at the time. Um, you know, but they recognize these subtle differences, but they can recognize, um, we didn't know how many, but probably a large number of different molecules on the surface of these cells, all different. So how would I really identify the ones that were important? And that was because with monoclonal antibodies, you could clone the cells that made them. Each, each hybridoma only made a single kind of antibody. So uh, I would clone them, and then I'd find out which uh, antibodies uh, were able to neutralize this interaction, which would prevent um, the killing of this target cell. And, um, and so that's how I made antibodies to, why I made antibodies to um, killer T cells. And I only selected the antibodies that would block the killing process. <clears throat> um, and the antigens we uh, identified were uh, required for antigen-specific killing. So uh, I, we just decided to be operational here. We didn't make any assumptions about what they were, um, but we knew that they were associated with lymphocyte function. We, so we call them lymphocyte function associated antigens or LFAs. Um, and um, very quickly, we identified um, a magnesium dependent pathway um, mediated by um, LFA1 on the lymphocyte and um, a molecule called ICAM on the other interacting cell. Um, and um, so, but to our surprise, in addition to this magnesium dependent um, pair of uh, receptors and, and counter receptors, we also found a magnesium independent pathway um, involving uh, the interaction between these two molecules. Uh, and um, one of the clear things about this early on to us was these were not antigen receptors. Um, um, and, um, but how could they work uh, in, in, in antigen-specific killing? Um, and the immunologists were all concerned that if we had um, adhesion molecules or cell recognition molecules, that they would abolish the specificity of this interaction, which they were so you know, focused on. Um, but what we found was that um, when the antigen receptor um, was activated, that it transmitted a signal that in turn, and actually this went through the actin cytoskeleton, which we didn't know until you know, recently, but we knew that it, it transmitted a signal in this um, uh, direction into the cell. And then there was another signal in the opposite direction, we call this inside out signaling, that activated LFA1. So, um, uh, the, um, the LFA1 actually did not abolish antigen-specific recognition. It actually enabled uh, this uh, T cell receptor to be even more sensitive than it would have been otherwise. Um, and the other uh, realization from this is that blocking either one of these two pathways would almost completely inhibit uh, T cell responses so that one could um, make a therapeutic to either one of these, because there's often situations in which um, the immune system goes haywire and we have autoimmune diseases um, and we need to tamp down um, immune reactions. And uh, one such autoimmune disease was uh, psoriasis, um, inflammatory disease of the skin. And um, so, uh, my laboratory, uh, in collaboration with Biogen, uh, sequenced LFA3, um, cloned it, and uh, then Biogen combined it with um, another portion of a molecule to make a chimeric molecule. Um, and, and this blocked um, the interaction between these two cells, just like our antibodies did. 
um, and was therapeutic. Uh, it helped patients with psoriasis. And now, um, uh, while we made the first antibodies um, to um, LFA1, we didn't actually patent them. Uh, we weren't you know, too knowledgeable about um, <laughs> you know, patents and biotech back then. We just wanted to get on and make the discoveries. Um, and so um, another later produced antibody was uh, licensed uh, by Genentech, and that was developed um, to LFA1 uh, to block uh, this pathway. And that also became um, a drug approved for psoriasis. So that was my early, um, early interaction with um, drug discovery. Two drugs came directly out of my laboratory research. Um, and um, this was just um, incredibly um, important um, to see this connection between basic research, because um, I was basically interested really in fundamental um, processes, how things worked at a molecular level. But to see it go this far, you know, into a therapeutic was, was really exciting and, and part of the fun I had. And um, so both drugs made a big difference in, in patient lives. Um, now, um, so why, so let me summarize what the impact of all this was. Uh, we had discovered cell recognition molecules in the immune system, and this changed the paradigm. Um, as, I, as I said, immunologists thought that cell recognition molecules would abolish antigen specificity. Um, but indeed, we found that LFA1 is activated by antigen recognition and inside-out signaling, and so um, it doesn't abolish, uh, but rather enhances antigen-specific recognition. Um, and these were the first examples of cell recognition molecules in the immune system. Um, they also were the first example of molecules on one cell that found a different kind of molecule on another cell in all of cell biology. Um, and, uh, um, and these were also the first example of therapeutics, the cell recognition molecules. Drug development is a very conservative industry. You don't tend to go far outside, you know, the paradigms. And so this set, you know, a wonderful precedent. These were the first antibodies or the first molecules that um, bound to cell recognition molecules on the surface of lymphocytes and um, were made into therapeutics. Um, and we published, um, a review article in Nature um, on, on these molecules in 1990. Um, that's one, one it's, it's a very highly started article uh, over 10,000 times. Um, one of my postdocs said it was dog-eared in the library. He could barely read it. It had been poured over so much. I mean, I think the reason was that um, other, a lot of other people were interested in what we did and um, they followed you know, in similar pathways. And after we described uh, these two uh, different pathways, um, at least nine more cell recognition receptor ligand pairs um, that worked in, in interactions between lymphoid cells and, and other cells were described by other investigators. And some of these have become very important. For example, um, PD-1 and PD-L1, you know, are now, um, now targets for immuno-oncology. And antibodies to these molecules are making a big difference in the lives of cancer patients. Uh, for some cancers, 30% um, of people uh, can uh, be, be cured uh, with, with this type of therapy. Um, and these are patients who would have never had a chance before. Um, and this checkpoint blockade in immunotherapy was recognized uh, by the Nobel Prize um, a few years ago um, to um, uh, uh, um, Tsutsumu, uh, sorry, um, boy, Hanjo, to, to Hanjo and Alice. Um, so now let me take the story in a different way. Um, so at about all the same time this was going on, um, I also discovered the first relationships in what would become known as the integrin family. Um, and so we were you know, purifying the molecules we had identified on the surface of uh, lymphocytes. 
Uh, so this, this is purified LFA1, and you can see that it has two building blocks. Um, these building blocks are, are an alpha subunit and a beta subunit that need to come together to form the LFA1 molecule. Um, and I had also previously, actually even with Cesar, made a monoclonal antibody that recognized an antigen on another kind of leukocyte called a macrophage. And it also had building blocks, uh, two building blocks um, with an alpha subunit and, and a beta building block. And um, they looked you know, suspiciously similar to one another. So I suspected they might be related. And um, we followed that up with um, some very detailed biochemistry. Um, and what we found was that um, these molecules indeed were related um, and that their uh, beta building blocks were identical and their alpha building blocks were different. And um, later on, um, we discovered um, the, the same molecules and even more uh, in humans and, um, and you know, the, same, the same principles. Um, so we'll come back to this story later. Um, but um, soon after this, um, and you know, publishing about these molecules and what their size was, a physician scientist at Boston Children's Hospital came to me and he was working on a patient that lacked um, surface molecules on their white blood cells. And it looked like their molecular weights might be roughly in the same range. Their sizes might be similar, uh, but there were no antibodies to them. So, um, you know, I wondered whether um, they actually might be the molecules I was working on that were missing. So um, the physician, Fred Rosen, um, who later became, you know, the president of the Center for Blood Research, where I moved my laboratory. It was at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute at this point. Um, uh, uh, got a sample of patient blood cells for me, and we tested them and found that indeed they lacked um, LFA1 and MAC1. And um, what we found later on was that there was a mutation in the common building block. And so all of these molecules were missing because you needed both the alpha building block and the beta building block to, for these molecules to make it to the cell surface and for them to do their jobs. And these patients had recurring life-threatening bacterial infections. And um, our antibodies allowed patients to be properly identified and grouped together uh, for the first time um, and uh, treated uh, with bone marrow transplantation. Um, and um, the, um, the, the phenotype, the, the, you know, the, the findings on these patients were that they had high levels of white blood cells in their circulation in their bloodstream, but these blood cells couldn't get out um, and make pus. So um, when most of us, you know, have an infection in our skin, we have, you know, a red looking lesion like this but that red lesion has a white spot in the middle of it. And that white spot is just because there's an accumulation of a very high concentration of white blood cells that make the pus look white or yellowish. And um, so these patients um, didn't have the pus. They only had the red swelling part. Um, and so that meant that um, the, um, the integrins we had discovered were not only important for um, adhesion of white blood cells um, one to another or to foreign cells, but they were also important for immigration of white blood cells out of the circulation into tissues. And um, there was some other work that showed that actually these patients were missing um, the ability to adhere to uh, the endothelial cells. These are the cells that line blood vessels. So we, we named um, this disease as um, leukocyte adhesion deficiency. And um, my laboratory became very interested in the process by which um, leukocytes leave the bloodstream and accumulate um, adocytic disease. Uh, and so I'm gonna show you some uh, videos taken uh, that uh, in, in, of in vivo of what, what this process looks like. Um, and the first step in this, whoops, um, yeah. The first step in this process 
Oops. Um, okay, let me go back. We'll get this to work. Well, I guess this movie is not going to work. Um, uh, but uh, so the first, the first step in the process is the rolling interaction, which the leukocytes roll um, with a jerking motion along the inner uh, side of the uh, blood vessel. And then the second um, step is that they develop uh, firm adhesion to the vessel wall. And the final step is a shape change uh, and you'll see the leukocyte immigrate through the endothelium, through the lining of the blood vessel into the tissue. And that's how they um, accumulate at sites of inflammation. And um, we're seeing another type of view of this here um, where um, the um, vasculature, the, the small veins and, and the small arterioles are in red. And uh, there are some leukocytes in, that are green and uh, when the leukocytes are inside the blood vessel, the colors merge, and so they, they look yellow. But these are the leukocytes, and you can see them rolling, moving slowly along the blood vessel wall. And then some of these are firmly adherent, and you'll, you'll be able to see them um, immigrate out of, out of the blood vessel into the tissue. And um, they don't accumulate um, around arterioles, they do it around veins. And, and so you can begin to see how um, a large number of leukocytes accumulate when they see the right signals um, uh, at a site in vivo that tell them there's um, something going on like a disease. And um, um, so we wanted very much what the molecular basis of this accumulation of cells at specific disease sites in the body uh, was. Uh, what molecules were involved? Well, um, we already, you know, had indication from the um, the patients that the integrins um, LFP1 and MAC1 uh, were were uh, required, um, and um, other people in the field had described selectins and their carbohydrate ligands, um, and um, others had also described chemotractants. Uh, chemotract and chemotractants and chemo sorry, and chemotractant receptors, um, which leukocytes uh, use to follow the scent of their prey, and also to find um, where um, where the blood vessels are showing signs of disease in the tissue that lies on the other side. Um, but it really wasn't clear what these molecules did in the vasculature, um, and whether they work together and how might they. Um, and um, so we um, did some studies and we started working with parallel wall flow chambers and um, we would infuse, uh, we pump uh, white blood cells through similar to the way they would be pumped through in the vasculature. And we put purified uh, molecules on the wall of the flow chamber, um, like a, a selectin or um, an IG family member. And um, the ICAM, the ICAM here. Um, and when we put the um, selectin on uh, the wall, to our surprise, the cells rolled. But having the ICAM there didn't make any difference. Um, but uh, if we then added a chemotractant uh, to the solution that was being pumped through, uh, the chemotractant would activate um, a uh, chemotractant receptor on the leukocyte, and that in turn would activate uh, through uh, actin, we know now, um, the integrins to become adhesive. Um, and um, so, uh, yeah, this movie, I hope, will play. Um, it looks like it's not playing. Um, we saw the first frame of the movie, um, but um, it's not playing now. All right, so it's funny. It worked, it worked before when I set it up um, yesterday. Um, I, I wonder what's going on. Um, and um, it's, um, it's actually sort of crushing. <laughs> but um, is, um, is anybody here that is, is Mike, Mikey still here? I guess not. Um, yeah. Um, 
I don't know. Yeah, do you think we can? Maybe I, I need to put the over um, the one on. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. All right. So maybe I just okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe if I yeah, well, I can do that too. All right. Shouldn't need to, but I can do that. Um, but it's not working. It's still not working. Meeting not found. All right. So um, hmm. it's on my computer here, but um, apparently it's looking for it somewhere else. It's embedded in my talk. It's 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 embedded. Hmm. Well, well, um, yeah, maybe we should just go on. Um, let's go on. Yeah. All right. Um, so what we found was that um, all um, of these, um, um, each molecule was important in that there were steps. And first you had to have the rolling interaction, and then the cell could be activated by chemotractin. And then um, while the integrins weren't playing any role to begin with, they would once they were activated and then they could bind ICAM here. And then the rolling adhesion that we saw in the first movie um, got um, converted to uh, firm adhesion. And so um, we had discovered uh, what was called the, the three-step area code model for leukocyte immigration at sites of inflammation. Um, and um, uh, the idea, we call this an area code model because we could use, uh, say, one uh, molecule in the hundreds position, one in the tens position, and then a final digit in the ones position. So say if we had a one, one, one area code, then one kind of um, leukocyte would be activated to come in. If we had a, um, a two, a three, a four area code, then a different kind of um, leukocyte with a different set of um, selectins, chemotractin receptors, and integrins could come in. And um, the reason this was so important was that there were um, many um, different um, cells um, in the immune system uh, that, um, that arose you know, during the course of differentiation. Um, and basically, these different classes of white blood cells are the body's warriors, and they all carry out different jobs. And um, different kinds of white blood cells are called into different types of infections. For example, one set is called into bacterial infections, another set to viral infections. And some actually specialize in certain parts of the body, like um, these cells that have an integrin called alpha-4 beta-7 are specialized to uh, work in the intestinal system, in the mucosal system. Um, and so, um, the, uh, each of the um, molecules in this area code system could serve as a target for uh, therapy. Um, and um, this opened up a whole new um, set of possible therapies for patients. Um, and to develop um, this, um, which is a much better, a much bigger project than anybody could do in their own laboratory, um, I founded um, a company called Leukocyte in 1993 to um, exploit um, this large number of new targets. Um, and um, so, and I'll tell you more about that story later. Um, but first of all, I, I just wanna say that, um, you know, in 1986, we sequenced um, these subunits. Um, and um, <clears throat> uh, when their sequences became known, it uh, was published that um, other, it was found that other uh, molecules uh, also um, had uh, alpha, alpha building blocks that were homologous in sequence. So they were all sister molecules. They were all related to one to another. And then um, a series of investigators, in, including Martin Himmler at DFCI, Richard Hines at MIT, um, and others, you know, characterized from a large number of molecules. And uh, we now know that there are um, um, 18 different alpha subunits and eight different beta subunits that come together very specifically to form 24 different um, alpha beta combinations. And um, binding of all of these uh, integrins 
the ligands requires magnesium. And um, so we were, we were onto something very early on. And many of these have become important as therapeutics. So um, uh, this one on platelets um, binds to fibrin clots and is very important in thrombosis. And um, it is antagonized not only by an antibody, but by two small drugs. Um, and, but these are only used um, briefly uh, during um, catheterization of patients. They're, they're never given chronically. Um, and um, I already mentioned um, LFA1, which was targeted by uh, Raptiva. And in 2004, to Sabri, uh, to uh, the integrin alpha-4, beta-1, and alpha-4, beta-7 uh, um, molecules was approved for multiple sclerosis, which is a very important drug um, for MS. Um, and uh, by 2014, um, in Tyvio, which we had begun developing at Leukocyte in the 1990s, became approved for ulcerative colitis. And this is now sold by Takeda and um, is their, currently their biggest uh, selling drug. Um, and both of these drugs have treated um, well over 100,000 patients each um, and have made um, a huge difference in patient lives. Um, and um, so um, Claire mentioned integrin conformational change, so, uh, which is something I've been interested in for a long, long time. Um, and I wanna, yeah, okay, great. I can show you this movie, um, which um, is going to show you an integrin. And we have something called um, a headpiece in front um, that um, is going to move um, upwards now. Um, and there's another kind of conformational change here uh, in the beta subunit. This is the beta subunit over here. Um, and um, so there are three different conformational states um, of these uh, molecules, and we call them um, vent closed, extended closed, and extended open. So these are different shapes, and they have different functions. And um, this one binds with high affinity um, to um, ligands, and this, these bind with very low affinity. And um, we've put um, a huge amount of work in understanding uh, these molecules so over the last, um, you know, um, almost about 40 years now. Um, and um, there, there's a lot of techniques like crystallography, very large microscopes called cryo uh, EM microscopy, um, single molecule manipulations using fluorescence, um, many, many different techniques have been used um, to study these, these molecules, and, and my lab has really been obsessed uh, by them for many years. Um, and I just want to say that um, while, you know, I'm telling you the big picture of what all this research has meant, that there are a lot of small details that also really matter. Um, and you have to get those small details right in order to... Um, develop the correct big picture. And, um, and one of those details I'll, I'll come to you in a minute on. And um, as I said, this is the um, high affinity state of the integrin. And Claire was talking about, you know, this was the molecule that I hypothesized linked to the um, actin cytoskeleton. Um, and that um, when this molecule binds a ligand and it's embedded, um, in the environment outside the cell. And then um, the actin uh, network of the cytoskeleton binds to this inside the cell, and then it exerts a pull on it because actin uh, filaments are always moving relative to plasma membrane. Um, that transmits a tensile force through the integrin. Um, and um, while on um, a cell in the absence of any activation, this is um, the predominant conformation over 99% of the molecules are in this conformation. This um, conformation becomes selected when uh, we have all of these things together. Um, and it's the force that's transmitted through the integrin that really um, makes, that stabilizes this extended conformation um, over this bent conformation. <clears throat> 
And um, there's one other point I want to make here before I go on, and that's that um, the small molecules I talked about uh, for um, platelet-mediated um, thrombosis, um, those bind right here, um, and they stabilize this uh, conformation. Now, this conformation would normally only be seen uh, you know, when the integrin is, is doing, doing its job you know, in concert with the actin cytoskeleton. But when the drugs are given, um, it induces this conformation in the absence of this. And for some reason that we don't totally understand, that is bad for cells and for us. So um, many pharmaceutical industries got thrilled with integrins in the 1990s and 2000s. And they developed small molecules based on the ones that were approved to treat thrombosis just temporarily. And they tried to develop those as oral therapeutics and you know, to be long lasting drugs. And almost every company, almost every major company had a program. And um, it turned out that the drugs failed. Actually, they made the patients worse. They had a higher incidence of heart attack than they did before. We don't totally understand the reason for that. But um, it seemed to be totally tied up with the ability of these molecules to induce this conformation when it shouldn't normally exist. And um, in the course of my, my research, we happened to discover a, a new kind of molecule that bound quite strongly to the same site, but it didn't induce this conformation. In fact, it stabilized the bent closed conformation. And um, that came down to a very small difference. It's a difference in one atom, one atom is you know, what made the difference in the drug. Um, and that's basically the discovery that we started um, Morphic Therapeutic on, which I'll, I'll touch in, uh, in, in, a, in a minute. Um, so um, yeah, I've gone through that. And I just wanted to illustrate uh, the study that Claire Waterman you know, described in great detail to you that we did here, because um, it's something that really got me strongly connected to uh, the Marine Biological Laboratory. It was a real pleasure working with Claire and uh, G2, and also um, uh, Rudolf um, and Tomomi, who built this special microscope um, here, this unique to the MBL that we used to find that the integrins um, were um, aligned by actin flow, and they were also tilted with respect to the membrane. So this was just one of many, many pieces of evidence for this activation model. And um, so um, in 2004, I was surprised to learn that um, I, together with Eugene Butcher, had been awarded the Crawford Prize for the discovery of this uh, three-step model of leuk leukocyte immigration from the vasculature. And in celebration, I commissioned a dance. Um, and I worked closely with um, the choreographer to show how the three-step model works. And particularly how integrins are activated. So I hope you can pick this up from the movie. Um, and um, I hope it works. This. <laughs> so about turning on. And now. Skeleton is really flowing. Uh, memories are really ruffling. Um, and um, I 
this activation signal is, is being transmitted to the uh, cytoplasmic remains of, of the integrins at their feet. Um, and um, pretty soon we're going to see you know, the, the actin cytoskeleton really grabbing a hold of, of the integrin legs, the, the cytoplasmic remains of the cell, and um, activate them. And um, we have to let them move a little more than they would um, but now you can see they're really excited, they're really, they're really activated. Now, um, Ligon and the Boots are much larger. And um, now we have, you know, multiple uh, integrins binding um, Ligon. Um, and <coughs> Uh, we have further signals being transduced um, into the cell, and uh, we're now going to see the influence of actin represent flow uh, moving these integrins um, you know, along the leading edge of the cell, providing track um, and uh, in the cell. So, um, I'm pleased that uh, this will be played for us. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Staff against theater. <laughs> right. Um, and so, um, you know, I'd just like to follow up a little bit on uh, entrepreneurship. Um, so uh, many, many, many patients have benefited from the drugs that um, have been created from some of the companies I, I'm going to talk, talk about. And um, I think some of the investors also did well. The investors in Leukocyte um, saw their stake increase 100-fold. Um, and as a founder, I did very well, too. Um, and, um, you know, we, we produced three drugs. Um, uh, Velcade and Campath-1 both treat cancer, and I told you about Antivio for ulcerative colitis. Um, so that really made a big difference. Um, and I, I never thought I would do as well. Um, if I started another company. So I decided to retire from doing, doing any, buy any more companies. Um, and, you know, I, I um, uh, during this period of my life, um, I was, um, um, developed my skills in crystallography, uh, EM, uh, single molecule biophysics, and maybe more importantly, um, I got remarried to my wife, Cha Fin, who's here in the audience today and um, had uh, two more children to the light of, to the, light of the three older ones. Um, and, uh, but around 2008, um, one of my, my colleagues um, asked if I would be interested in investing in a company that, that he'd founded. And I said, yeah. And, and then one thing led to another. So I met somebody on the board of directors, Amuna Schott, who became my biotech muse and you know, got me interested in founding more companies. Um, and um, I also um, became uh, uh, a resident professor at Pfizer, which meant that once, once a day, one day every month, I would visit the company and hear about their drug development. Um, and then um, Derek Rossi came to me, who was um, a colleague at my institute and had been trying to start a company working on modified RNA. And he had some exciting ideas for how that modified RNA could be used. And um, <clears throat> I'd never heard about modified RNA before, but you could do a lot of things with it. You could put it in cells and you could make any protein you wanted to. And you wouldn't be limited to um, just making proteins that were, that were in the bloodstream, which is what basically almost all um, biological molecules that we use today do. They, they're just in the bloodstream. RNA can make um, um, proteins that are inside a cell. Um, and it all, also, we knew very early on, they were also very good at, for making vaccines. Um, <clears throat> and, um, but, but Derek, you know, had been taken by our uh, technology transfer officer um, to various um, venture capital um, uh, groups and nobody would invest. They lined up a Harvard Business School professor to, to help them and that also came to naught. And they came to me and I really saw the value in it and um, the possibilities and said I would love to invest. And I helped them 
um, find um, a co-founder, um, Bob Langer, because he knew a lot about, um, <clears throat> about delivering nucleic acids like RNA. And I also um, connected Derek to uh, Flagship Ventures, um, which decided they wanted to invest in it. And uh, they put up two thirds of the initial investment. I put up one third. Um, and, um, and I can't you know, claim uh, responsibility, any responsibility at all for the COVID vaccine. I was on the board of directors until they went public a few years ago and I helped guide them. Uh, but they're just a fabulous group um, of individuals who've really built wonderful technology. Um, and, um, but I think it's probably fair to say that if I hadn't stepped in at that time, that the company uh, might not be here today, or if it was, it would be in some other form. Um, and, um, and then um, in 2012, I founded um, and invested in a company called Scholar Rock, um, and they have two antibodies in the clinic. Um, and one is uh, for immuno-oncology to TGF beta, and the other one is um, uh, to um, a, a, a molecule that when it binds to the molecule, it, it uh, helps muscles grow. And this is being used in, in patients with spinal muscular atrophy. And the phase two results are really incredibly encouraging. There's really been dramatic improvements in those patients' lives. I mean, then I was um, a, a founding investor, investor, but a small one um, in, uh, in Editas. And then um, I founded and invested in Morphic Therapeutic. Um, and we have a small molecule um, in the clinic right now. Um, and um, and that, that, that company really came out of seeing this very small difference of one, how one atom in a um, antagonist could make the difference between an antagonist that would favor one confirmation over an antagonist that would favor another confirmation. Um, and, um, and then more lately, I've found and invested in further companies. But um, I wanna point out that already in 2017, um, I really uh, felt that I needed to give back. And there was an area that I felt very strongly about um, where I thought that um, I had a vision that could make a difference and the NIH wasn't funding it. And so I became the, the co-founder and, and funder and chair of the Institute for Protein Innovation and Nonprofit. Um, and I wanna tell you a little bit about it. So um, we've heard, we all know about the huge impact of the Human Genome Project. And that created a list of parts for biological organisms. Um, but um, it didn't tell us how the parts assemble and work together. And it's really proteins, not DNA or RNA, it's really proteins that make the machines of life and do almost everything in our body. Um, and, um, but proteins really haven't received much attention. You know, it's the DNA and the RNA and genomics that really, really, you know, have really had their day. Um, and, but, you know, people in the pharmaceutical industry, biotech, come to me and they say, we need more protein chemists. Help us train these people. We don't have them. Um, and proteins are the targets of almost all drugs. And they themselves are 50% of newly approved drugs, including antibodies. And they're powerful research reagents. Um, and so we feel a need to rebuild protein science to advance biological discovery and medicine really beyond genomics. And our mission is to advance protein science to accelerate research and improve human health. Um, you know, as a nonprofit, we provide academia and industry with synthetic antibodies and deep protein expertise. And we want to empower um, researchers to unlock the most elusive mysteries of biology. Um, we now have um, 45 um, investigators at um, IPI, and about half of those people are working on our, um, our the synthetic antibodies, which we make via yeast display, a very different technology than Cesar Milstein taught me. Um, and um, the, the Milstein technology um, allows you to make an antibody in say a mouse that recognizes only the parts that are different in a human. Um, but the, um, the yeast technology allows us to make antibodies uh, that bind to uh, epitopes that are identical in mouse and human. And, and these kinds of molecules um, 
are particularly uh, important in neurobiology and developmental biology. I mean, many of those molecules are 100% identical, and you cannot make a species-specific antibody to them. So the neurobiologists and developmental biologists are really desperate for, for better antibodies. And um, we're, you know, we're going to um, make that happen um, through um, an open science model. Um, and there are many you know, further advantages to these antibodies, including if we can make them uh, bind to the same protein, the same antibody bind to the same protein in mouse and human, we can, um, if there's a therapeutic possibility, we can check um, you know, that um, antibody out in a mouse model of disease and then develop basically the same antibody in humans. Um, but I think most of these will really be important for researchers, you know, to do uh, new discovery research. Um, and um, that's, so that's a very important mission that we're advancing. Um, and I want to thank you, you know, for your attention. Um, and I particularly want to thank my teachers and colleagues, um, you know, that say teach um, everywhere, high school, uh, universities. Um, some of them are here uh, during the summer. Uh, including from my alma mater, Cal even Deepam is from there and two of the course directors right here, right now are from Berkeley. And I just think it's phenomenal what they do, um, you know, teaching and enriching people. And throughout my, my career, I've been privileged to learn new technologies as I've gone along from my colleagues. Um, and, and, you know, this is really, I think it's really fun to learn and continue to learn, you know, um, as you go along. And I, I continue to thrive on that. Um, and um, I want to thank my funders, who are almost all, all the National Institutes of Health, you know, the many trainees I've worked with, many of whom I've learned as much from as they've learned from me. I mean, I want to thank my family, you know, including my, my wonderful bride, uh, Cha Fan, who's here with me today. Thank you very much. So, yeah. So we have time for just a few questions. Um, and if you're in the audience and you have a question, just please feel free to come down and use one of the microphones at the front of the auditorium. And then uh, you can also submit questions via Zoom online. It sounds like we have one question already online. All right, we have our first question, and that is, at what stage in your career did you decide to pursue the creation of a company, and did it ever conflict with your desire to pursue a career in academia? And can you tell us how you moved from the conception of your company, from your research, to its execution and creation? Sure. Um, well, um, you know, part of the mission of um, a university is to um, a part of the mission of education is to um, improve the economy um, and to help um, people and um, um, you know just just and and you know invention in general um, and um, so when I started my first company um, I had it cleared uh, with con there's always a conflict of interest committee. Um, it went to the university. There was a procedure for doing this. Um, they licensed a patent um, to leukocyte. And, um, you know, at Harvard and I think in many universities, you are free to uh, consult um, one day a week. Um, and so that's, you know, it was in this consulting capacity that, um, that I, I founded. Um, uh, leukocyte and further companies. Okay, uh, got it. Sounds like we got a few coming on online, so just keep going. Don't be shy if you want to come down to the microphone. How have anti plaque antibodies, uh, how sorry, how are anti plaque antibodies working to eliminate? 
plaque from the brains of patients with Alzheimer's? Oh, um, so um, are, is that a, yeah, okay. So how, how can antibodies eliminate uh, plaques from the brains of Alzheimer's patients? Um, well, antibodies trigger phagocytosis of um, um, debris. Um, and so if you have an anim antibody that binds to amyloid, um, it will um, mark the amyloid for, for clearance, um, much as um, a bacteria is marked for clearance. And um, specifically, there's a kind of macrophage in the brain called a microglial cell. And it would be the microglial cell that um, carries out that, that clearance process. But there's a lot of difficulties, including getting the antibody into the brain. Um, you know, antibodies don't, don't um, get into the brain very easily because of the blood brain barrier. But um, that um, is, a, is something that is, there's at least enough of aducanumab that gets into the brain to do that job. Nobody from the audience? All right, well, we're just about at time. So let's thank Dr. Springer one last time. Yeah, yeah.